sociologist, he was a politician, and he was a very keen gardener. He, he had a really nice garden. He used to grow a lot of fruit, a lot of veg. He even grew grapes for his own wine. And one day when he was out shucking peas, anyone used to shuck peas? I'm waiting for Ray's hand to go. Oh, I, yeah. reckon Ray, I reckon Ray's a pea shucker. Uh, if he's not a pea shucker, he's a pea shucker son. Um, so he was out there shucking peas, and what he worked out was that 20% of his plants actually delivered 80% of his peas. And the other 80% of his plants only gave him this tiny little pile of 20% of his peas. And then he started looking at other things that he was involved in. So as a politician, he was looking at land ownership in Italy. And he realized that 80% of the land was owned by just 20% of the people. And when he looked at the wealth in Italy, it was the same again. The richest 20% of the population owned 80% of the wealth. And have a think about your businesses and your clients. I bet your top 20% of clients give you 80% of your business, right? And flip that around the other way, the bottom 20% of your clients give you 80% of your problems. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes. And there's that magical thing that all great business coaches will tell you, that we should fire some of our clients, and they are normally right down there at the bottom 20% to give you 80% of the problems. Now, we know that as the 80-20 rule. It's also called the Pareto Principle. And the reason we do these events is because we put the top 20% of your region in a room together and allow you to cross network. We essentially network up. Now, you see, I started doing these about five years ago in my region, and in my region, we were passing about four and a half million pounds worth of business. When I started talking about my first green club, we had 15 one five members in the green. This month, we had 146, and my region has done 14.6 million pounds. And the reason is because my region was full of passionate members that loved their chapters but didn't really care or know about the rest of the region. I mean, they were in this thing called BNI, but mainly they were in the Churchill chapter or the Spitfire chapter or the Prince Imperial chapter. But now what they do, rather than jumping on Google, they ask our director team if there's someone else in the region where we can place the business. Because cross-regional events like this allow you to network up. And the thing is, we all network up. So, here's me at Ivan Lyfer's house. We flew out, this was my last trip before the pandemic hit. And Ivan is a far, the founder of BNI, he's a father of modern networking. Do we think that Ivan networks up? Yep. Yep. What do we reckon? Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's him two weeks before Julian and I flew out. He's on uh, Necker Island there with Richard Branson. Richard Branson, one of the most dynamic billionaires in the world. Do we think that Richard Branson networks up? What do we reckon? Of course he does. Yeah, of course he does. There he is with the Queen, the most powerful woman in the world other than Frankie. <laughs> and... <laughs> And do we think the Queen networks up? Of course she doesn't. She networks down. <laughs> she goes right, right down and drags them up. So, um, so look, these words, these events are so important and it's all about the C word. Now, genuinely, can you tell me what the C word is? Connections. Come on. <laughs> it's culture. It's culture. And Ivan says that culture eats strategy for breakfast. How many of you have seen a brilliant person walk into a not so brilliant company or not so brilliant group and they start being not so brilliant? How many of you have seen members walk into your chapters 
that are distinctly average and they become amazing because they've walked into spirit or walked into A to Z or they've walked into B for B or they've walked into every other one that and that people are now ahead of. Apollo! Woo! Yeah! So I, she, uh, she was about to throw something out there. She was really going for it there. And the thing is, it's implied culture. We adopt the culture around us. So when we surround ourselves with amazing people, all of a sudden we go back to our chapters and we say to the people that weren't here, you've got to come next time because there is this guy here who does something similar to you, but there's got to be some synergy there. Now I've got members in my region that are competitors, but when they get too busy, they pass referrals to their competition because they know their competition are BNI members and they're people like them. And all culture means is the way we do things around here. And they'll look after their clients and hand them back having a wonderful experience after the job's done. That is why we do this. And I want to tell you about the five monkey experiments to demonstrate how powerful culture can be. Now there are five monkeys in the room. These monkeys are called Brian, Ian, <laughs> Ray, no, they're not. Sorry, I don't know what their names are, but um, there's five monkeys in the room, and in the middle of the room is a ladder with their favourite piece of fruit on it. Now, this experiment has been quoted in 18 individual books, published books, and there was a research scientist that did an 18 minute <coughs> TED talk live, streamed live on stage about this experiment. It's called the Five Monkey Experiment. Write it down, look it up. Um, so you put five monkeys in a room, it's in a controlled environment, and in the middle of the room is this step ladder, and on top of the ladder is their favorite piece of fruit, a bunch of bananas. The alpha of the group sees his favorite piece of fruit and goes to climb the ladder. Just before he's able to reach for fruit, the research scientists turn on a high pressure water hose. Ice cold water at high pressure and they douse the monkey. Not only do they douse the monkey that is climbing the ladder, they also turn the hose on the other four monkeys in the room. And they retreat into a corner and they huddle down until the hose is turned off. And when it's all gone quiet, that same monkey looks around again, he sees the bananas are still there, and he goes to climb the ladder. And just before he hits the fruit, the hose comes on again. Douses them all with ice cold water, they all retreat to a corner, and that keeps happening until the monkeys ignore the bananas. So they keep going for it, hose turns on. Keep going, hose turns on. Normally, after four or five times, the monkeys decide it's just not worth getting cold and wet for, we're gonna ignore those bananas. Then, the research scientists change out one of the monkeys. Now, I know that that isn't a monkey, that's a primate. Do you know the difference between monkeys and primates? Does anyone know? Monkeys have tails, primates don't. I learned that at Disney. <laughs> um, so, you change out one of the monkeys, and of course, monkey comes in the room, he's like, guys, bananas. So they go to climb the ladder and the other four monkeys pull him down. So they pull him back down because they know if he gets anywhere near those bananas, this hose is going to come on and it's going to absolutely soak them. So they pull him down. And then systematically they change out one of the old monkeys and put in a new one. Same thing happens. They do it for a third time, put in a new one, goes for the bananas, pulls down, nothing. Until there are five monkeys in that room and none of them have ever been doused with water. But when the fifth replacement monkey comes in, he sees the bananas, he goes for the ladder and the other four monkeys pull him down. None of them have ever been doused by water. None of them. 
But the implied culture in that room is that we don't touch that. That's how powerful peer pressure can be. And in fact, pack behaviour can be so powerful, as I said, that has been quoted in almost 20 books. There, someone has put their professional reputation on the line to present that as a TED talk, and it is 100% fake. People have heard the story, they bought into it, it doesn't exist. I've done a lot of research on it, the closest I could find was something about monkeys and marshmallows, and an air horn that scared them. However, why people were going for that when there are brilliant experiments out there called the ASH experiment to demonstrate exactly the same thing, I don't know. So, we're going to play a bit of a game. On one side of the screen are three lines, and on the other side of the screen is a single line. All I want you to do is tell me which of the three lines matches the single line. Okay, you ready? So this one is A, B, and C, so I just want you to shout out A, B, or C as quickly as possible, please. <coughs> C. 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 Ah. I don't think you've set that. It's actually B, sorry, it must be the angle of the, uh, of the projector. Let's do it again. This one's one, two, three, just do it quickly. One, one, one. Um, Brian, this is totally wrong, mate. So the answer is actually two. It's two, I'm with, it's two. It's not, you are all right, but that is what the ASH experiment is. So there's a room full of people and they're shown cue cards. And to begin with, when they're lined up, everyone gives the correct answer. But then, all of a sudden, people start saying that different lines match. And you're thinking, that's not right. They definitely match. However, the other people were research scientists, and you're the only true volunteer in the room. How long would it take you to change your mind, do you think? Now, some of you go, oh, I wouldn't change my mind. No, no, I'll do it right the way to the end. However, I'm going to show you a video uh, and check out the guy in the uh, very fetching cardigans. He's quite old. Um, and just see how quickly he went with the peer pressure in the group. Uh, one. 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 Two. One. Three. 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 In 86% of the cases, the person decided to go against his own eyes and go with the implied pressure in the room. And if you genuinely believe you wouldn't do that, you are one of only 14 out of 100 people that wouldn't. Now that is quite a serious one. Go and look up the Ash experiment. It is a brilliant example of implied culture. There is a funnier one coming. This is from the original candid camera, and it's what they call the lift sketch. I adore this. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt, the lady with the trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff, will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat... his individuality, but little by little, <laughs> he looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject, here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least, and uh, this man has apparently been in groups. <laughs> Here's a fella with 
his hat on in the elevator. First he makes a full turn to the rear and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door, everybody's changed positions. <laughs> use group pressure for some good. Now, in a moment, on Charlie Siegel, everybody turns forward. Very, notice, they take off their hats. And now, do you think we could reverse the procedure? Watch. It's amazing what we just naturally do. So if you stumble into a group that always turns up dead on seven o'clock and leaves at half past eight. Doesn't matter how early you turn up the first time, you'll always end up turning up dead on seven o'clock and leaving at half past eight. However, if you turn up at 25 to seven and people have been in the room for 35 minutes, all of a sudden your arrival time starts creeping backwards and backwards and backwards until you're one of the very first in the room. Culture is just how we do <coughs> things around here. And this beautiful, beautiful lady uh, is the Vice Rear Admiral Grace Hopper. She was the first female Rear Admiral in the American Navy. And what's amazing about this was that she applied to the Navy in 1944 after uh, studying a uh, maths degree at Harvard in a very early um, pioneering field of computer science. And she was turned away by the US Navy because uh, she was a woman. So she joined um, the US Navy Reserves. And she was already seen as too old to do any good at the age of 34 when she joined. But the US Naval Reserve, because of a recommendation from her Harvard professor, allowed her to join. You see, she wrote all of the computer code for the missile guidance systems that are still in use today. And she retired from the Navy Reserves only to be called up six months later by the US Navy. The same Navy that 40 years before had refused entry because she was too old and a woman drafted her back in to maintain the computer codes that she wrote. She was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom and there is now a computer science lab named after her at um, Harvard University. And her famous phrase is the most dangerous phrase in the English language is we've always done it that way. She was one for breaking the norm, for challenging stereotypes, and she wasn't going to allow anyone to tell her that she couldn't do something. I'll take a picture of that, that might be better. No, they're not here. Oh, excellent. Some of you may have seen this video. It's one of my favourite videos. Um, it's taken on a hand camera without stabilisation, so it is a bit shaky. Listen to the commentary. This is a genuine TED Talk, um, and it is one of the best examples <coughs> of leadership and how to start a movement that I have ever, ever seen. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So he takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. 
If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over-glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. filming that was saying how did he do that how did he do that now obviously she didn't have the benefit of the commentary that we had but I know you've got some of the fastest growing groups in the whole of the UK and Ireland in your region right now and some of you have been part of that and there must have been that moment where someone stood up and went I think we should bring guests if we bring I think that should just be something that we do and someone would have said oh we've tried that it doesn't work Let's send out some visitors, let's send out some letters, let's do a visitor to, oh yeah, we used to do that, it doesn't work. However, next time you hear someone saying something, next time you see a low nut, if you take one piece of advice from tonight, courageously follow. Don't be the one to ridicule, don't be the one to pour doubt on what they're saying. If you see that lone nut, then you be the first follower. You don't have to take your shirt off. Don't worry. Uh, Ray, you can if you want, but uh, that's absolutely fine. And the thing is, culture is such a powerful thing. How do we know when we've got it right? Well, I'm going to end with a story about someone that joined my very first chapter that I was a member of down in Sussex. Now you see, this guy came in and he was doing okay. He was a young guy, kind of 26, 27 years old. And uh, he was what I'd refer to as a 90 minute member. So does that, is that a familiar phrase to some people? So like they would turn up dead on seven o'clock and then they'd be straight out the door at half past eight and you wouldn't see or hear from them um, for a week until you saw them at the next meeting. Now, luckily, my sponsor, a guy called Henry Laker, took this guy under his wing and forced him to sit down after a meeting and just say, look, I can see you've, uh, there's something about you. I can see you've got a bit of sparkle, but it's not connecting. What's going on? And what it transpired is that this guy's <coughs> mum was incredibly ill. And what was worse was this guy's mum there was an option to help her, but they didn't have the money to do it. And he was running the business all by himself. He had joined BNI to try to get more revenue in because his dad was his business partner. And um, so his dad was acting as a carer for his mum, and he was there trying to run the business single-handedly and generate new income. So. 
What my chapter did is what your chapters would do. We went to work. So Henry sent out an email, to, this was before WhatsApps, Henry sent out an email to all of us and said, look, we need to look after this guy. He could be something very good, but right now he needs our help. We need to invest in him and we need to help his mum. So they started doing all different sponsorship things. So we did that thing where you put people in stocks and you throw wet sponges at them. And it was like 50p a sponge. So the leadership team, bless them, volunteered to go in the stocks. And the secretary treasurer raised one pound 50. <laughs> and the president raised about 10 pounds. <laughs> and the vice president raised 1,750 pounds. Because <laughs> everyone wants to throw a sponge as vice president, didn't they? Um, I did a sponsored weight loss. Yeah. <laughs> I used to do a fat joke at that point, but, uh, but thanks to Frankie's calorie counting, I'm feeling pretty good right now. Uh, we did this thing where the, uh, Henry, who was president at the time, let his hair grow back. He'd always shaved his head, and no one really knew why. And when his hair grew back, we realised <laughs> it looked a little bit like a on his head, uh, so he let it grow back and then he shaved it off again. Um, so, and we sponsored that. And when all was said and done, we had raised 17,000 pounds for this guy's mum. And unfortunately, however much Frankie and I want this to be true, we don't live in a Disney fairy tale. So, by the time we had raised that money for him, his mum was past the point where that medication could do any help. But we asked him, what can we do to make her comfortable? And her last wish was that she wanted not to die in a hospice, however wonderful and beautiful those places are, but she wanted to die in the home where she had raised her kids surrounded by people who loved her. So we used the money to buy a rise and recline chair so she could still get out of uh, and, and be mobile. We put in a stair lift so she could get up and down the stairs. We put in mobility aids like a bath lift, like the things that make it easy to turn on the taps. And in the latter part of her life, we hired in a hospital airflow bed. And when the time came, she passed away in a house that she had raised her kids in, surrounded by people that she loved. But we didn't stop there. We realised that our member <coughs> was in a world of pain. But we didn't let him suffer alone. Members turned up to his place of work to have random one-to-ones with him. People helped him build a wall around a new piece of equipment that he had had ironically delivered on the day that his mum died. And we made sure that the only BNI meeting he missed was on the Thursday morning where he delivered the eulogy at his mum's funeral in a packed church in Crawley, West Sussex, whilst every member of the chapter lined the back wall and maintained eye contact with him, giving him the strength to send his mum off in the way that she deserved. When my mum died, my family and my friends were in as much pain as I was. And it was my B&I chapter that rallied around me and lifted me out of the darkest place I've ever been in, in my life. They didn't do it for promise of reward or recognition. They did it because that's the way they do things around here. And I made a promise to my BNI members that I will spend the rest of my life paying back for kindness that they showed 
a 27 year old guy who wasn't particularly invested and they would have had every single right to dismiss. What you do in your chapters doesn't only change the way the world does business, it doesn't only change people's lives, it saves people's lives. <coughs> Whether you realise it or not, there are people in your chapters today that wouldn't be with us if it wasn't for your culture. Thank you for all you do on behalf of everyone else. And just remember that your culture does not make the people. It is you, the people, that make your culture. Thank you.